All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast. If you recall from episode eight, we did an introduction to note investing where Adam interviewed me. And if you know by now Adam's investor identity is multifamily. So he is a multifamily investor and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to learn all about multifamily investing from Adam Ulrey. So Adam, what is going on in the multifamily space or what's going on in your world? Hey, Kevin. Um, well, I got a call from my property manager at work yesterday. And after I got off work, I checked my voicemail and looks like the AC on my duplex is blowing hot air. So that's what's oh. going on right now. I had to send the HVAC contractor over there to <laughs> check it out. Perfect timing, especially because it's getting warm in of course it's it starts to get warm and all of a sudden you get the calls about the ac not working so <laughs> <laughs> i'm just crossing my fingers that it's nothing expensive right now <laughs> you mean your tenants can't just tough it out right or fix <laughs> it <laughs> can you guys just fix that <laughs> that would be great that sucks so have have you uh how do you incorporate and foresee expenses like that when you're, say, purchasing or um, doing the rent or stuff like that. Yeah, I, I factor that in to my underwriting. It's really important that you do. And a lot of people don't, by the way. I mean, you would be surprised, especially the amateur investors or people who are new to it. They, they want the numbers to work so bad. They just think, well, I don't need to include uh, a factor for maintenance or I don't need to include a factor for longer term capital expenses, the big stuff like the roof or the driveway. I mean, if you buy and hold something for long enough, you really should expect you're going to have to put a driveway in. I, I put a driveway in uh, my rental house last year. Um, you know, I mean, if you're going to hang on to these things for 20 or 30 years or longer, you're going to have to do that stuff. So you factor that in when you're buying the deal. Make it a percentage of the costs over time and, uh, and make sure the deal's still profitable for you. Absolutely. I think that's important is understanding your expenses and how that's going to play out. So I want to ask you, and just to dive right into it, why is multifamily a, uh, an asset that somebody would be interested in investing in? Well, it's a good question. And I, I kind of think about multifamily in two ways. There, there is what I call small multifamily, which is one to four units. And then what I call either larger multifamily or commercial multifamily, which is five units and above. And they're actually pretty different assets. Um, the small multifamily is treated just like a house. You can get um, the same type of a mortgage, so your debt service is similar. Uh, a lot of the things about it are very much like owning a house. But the anything five and above is considered commercial. And so the, the type of debt you get on the property is completely different. You know, I mean, other things are different as well. Um, you know, like the insurance companies look at those things a little bit differently and, and things like that. So I'm focused on the commercial larger multifamily. So right now I'm focused on five to 100 units. And the reason I'm focused on that, uh, well, I've got a lot of reasons why I'm focused on that. <laughs> <laughs> so what are your top three then? I'll tell you about it. Um, my top three are all around freedom. What, what I've defined for myself as a freedom lifestyle. So I, I, sat, um, I sat down when I first started to develop my interest in investing and, and really took quite a lot of time deciding what I wanted to invest in. And, you know, whether it be stocks or some type of real estate, other things to consider. And then over time, I, I sort of found my way to, to real property, rental property that I could buy and hold for a long time. And um, the, the reason I ended up where I am in, at a kind of a basic level is because it matches up very well to my goals, my personal goals in life. And the large multifamily matches up with that the best. It allows me to achieve 
what I call a freedom lifestyle, which means freedom of my time, freedom of my physical location, uh, freedom to buy what I want. So freedom over my finances. And I think it's a faster way to achieve that. And I also think it gives me more options around how to scale. So okay. I can scale quickly. I can also scale um, I, very, uh, very large if I want to. So there are, I, this term scale, I think it's tossed around a lot, uh-huh. and especially in the regards of entrepreneurship. And you, can you elaborate what you mean by having the ability to scale? Yeah. This means to grow my wealth and my assets and my business very large, to, to grow it larger, to expand it. That's what scale means. So an example would be, let's say uh, I acquire 20 units and then I decide I want 200 units. I would be scaling from 20 to 200. This asset class allows you to do that very quickly and multiple ways. I can partner with others and get a 200 unit property. Or I can uh, try to just get several, s- several more 20 or 50 unit properties. Uh, lots of different ways to make it happen. But if you want to grow quickly and you want to grow very large, you can. Okay. And how is, how is it different than, say, having multiple? So instead of having five doors on a multifamily property, what's that, how is that different than having five single family homes? The way it's different is because um, you, you, have the, uh, you have the benefit of economies of scale. So you can buy five units on one property, one location under one roof, and and you just benefit from everything being there and and in one building. You know, if you have to have a roof put on, it's one roof instead of five. Uh, Because the five are at five different locations if it's a house. They're they're not going to be right there next to each other, right? Which means effectively five different projects if I'm a roofer. Exactly. I mean, even if they're next door, they're not connected. You're up and down that ladder, right? You're not on the roof putting that thing together all at once. Uh, those types of things add up. Um, you know, the systems in the buildings, in your, you have five different houses, it's almost a certainty that you're going to have five different AC units. You know, the brand or the model, the size, all of that's just going to be different, right? But in an apartment building, uh, they're probably the same the exact same one was put in each one. Um, you know, things like that, just the systems in these things are the same and it, 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 you're just able to capitalize on that. So that's one thing that's different. Okay. And what would uh, be another thing that's different? Something else that's different is the way you can grow your wealth. And that's, that's probably one of my favorite things on it uh, is your, your ability to generate revenue, in my opinion, is greater because the, um, the value of the property is determined by how much revenue it generates. So with a commercial multifamily, I can make some improvements that allow me to increase the rent by a pretty small amount. And that, that levers the, the value of the building because of the calculations that, um, that are used to determine the value of the building, just a small amount of raise per door and rent turns out to be a very large increase in value of the property itself versus single family or small multifamily where the value is determined by comparables, by similar properties in the vicinity that are appraised by an appraiser. So what you're saying is there's more of an ad- objective approach on determining the value of, say, a commercial property due to the fact that it's an income-generating asset, whereas a single family, there's, even if you are renting it out, it's still priced comparably to, uh, there's some subjectivity to it compared to the, the similar houses in the area. 
Yeah. And, and you have less control over it. You have a lot less control over what it's going to be appraised at. So when you're looking for apartments, uh, what are some market markers, if you will, that you look for that's different than if you were to search for a single family? Um, I, so I, I don't really know how different they are because I, I think whether you're going to, whether you're going to look for a multifamily or a single family, um, you're going to kind of decide what market you want to be in. Uh, you know, you're going to decide what the neighborhood would look like, um, what class of, um, of property or neighborhood you're, you want to be in. So, you know, I'm not sure how much different that, that would be um, when you're first determining. I guess one thing that may be different, though, is with the apartments, you might not be buying them all in the same market. So if you do start to move around and, you know, say, buy one here in Florida, uh, and then the next one I'm going to buy in Georgia, I would have to do additional research on the the market there. But, you know, it's kind of like uh, what, um, you know, you want strong economic indicators, regardless of whether you're investing in the small stuff or the big stuff. You know, you want to know that you're in a, a healthy market where people are going to stay there and, and families are coming in and, and renters are, are there and there's, you know, strong rent demand and things like that. I, I think that's, that's pretty similar. You don't want a market where people are leaving, uh, properties are declining, rent uh, demand is declining, that sort of thing. Okay, so you want to still be in a strong market. Uh, though, yeah. So those types of indicators are something you would still be consistent with searching for a multifamily apartment <laughs> that's similar to what you would for a single family home. Yeah, yeah, at, le- at least it is for me. Um, so I know, I know some of the... Uh, some of the bigger guys that that invest in very large apartments, uh, you know, maybe two or three hundred unit apartments, they're certainly more sophisticated than someone like I am. Uh, so they probably have some, they have some probably sophisticated, well defined criteria that I may not use. But um, for me, that's the truth. I think that's important is it's up to you. You're the one that's making the investment anyway, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as long as the, as the market fundamentals are strong, as the, the property will cash flow and, and make money and help me meet my financial goals, allow me to help my investors meet their financial goals, then it's going to work for me. I'm in pretty good shape. That's awesome. Uh, one one thing that the term that I keep hearing about, if you search multifamily investing, apartment investing, whether you're going to do some type of a syndication, which we'll get into kind of clarifying that, uh, but is this cap rate? I, you hear that a lot. Almost every time there's an apartment, then, well, what's the cap rate? What's the cap rate? So for our listeners that have no idea what that is, and myself who still needs a little bit more of an understanding, what is a cap rate exactly? Yeah. So you're right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, ambiguity about that like uh, even even some experts don't really agree on on what the cap rate is um but the cap rate is it, it essentially tells you the the value of a property uh relative to other properties in that market or the value of that type of property in that market so it's supposed to be a way to compare uh the value of a property Okay. All right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So do you look for a higher cap rate or a lower cap rate for a multifamily property? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so y- you want to buy with a high cap rate. Uh, and if you're going to sell it, you want to sell with a low cap rate. Um, so the, it's kind of like it's the inverse of the value, I guess you could think of it that way. Very, very simply, right? So if, um, if the cap rate's high, the cost of the property is going to be lower than when the cap rate is low. So you want to buy high and sell, or sorry, you want to buy low and sell high. Uh, right now, cap rates are, are really, really low. Um, 
uh, there are a lot of people buying large multifamily properties out there at cap rates uh, six and below, and and that's considered really low. Okay. And so anything above six is considered high or double digits? Is that considered really high? Double digits is, is considered high. Um, so it's, you know, in my opinion, things are really overpriced right now. You know, the, the market's very inflated and you're paying much more to get into the investment right now. Uh, so if you're buying right now, you have to be very careful. I mean, the numbers really need to work in terms of being able to cash flow and you need to be stress testing your deals, which means during your underwriting process, when you're adding the costs and the, the revenue and trying to determine how much profit this, this thing will generate, you need to run through some scenarios that could happen if the market corrects and people start losing their jobs. So you lose renters or you have renters who can't pay the rent and uh, you may have to lower the rent rates in your properties because people simply can't afford the, the high rents anymore. And you need to be able to, to know that if you do those things, you can still cover the debt on the property and be able to hang on to the property until you get out of that, that slump in the market. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're saying that, uh, when you say stress test, stress test, I think that's a fantastic way of putting it uh, because it's important to know, hey, if in the worst case scenario, how would I still hold up? So I think that is also huge. Uh, when we're talking about multifamily, it's like intuitively, if I wanted to see single family and see what's for sale, you can go onto Zillow and get an idea. Where do you, if somebody like you, like a multifamily investor, where do you find this information? Uh, yeah, that's a good. So you're asking about uh, properties for sale and where I might find those and things like that. Exactly. Yeah, that that's a good question. Um, there are some sites out there, kind of like commercial uh, equivalents of a of a Zillow and LoopNet is a really popular one. A lot of okay. people use LoopNet, and there are some like that. So that's one place you can check. Um, Sometimes these things end up on the MLS, so it's really good to have a realtor out there looking for you. Um, another place are brokers. A lot of multifamily investors go through brokers, so it's good to establish relationship with a couple of brokers who are well-respected in your market. And then my favorite way to do it um, is to look for off-market deals and go directly to the owners. So that is good old-fashioned direct marketing, like sending them letters, giving them a phone call, trying to get a hold of them and let them know you'd like to buy their property if they ever decide to sell it. <laughs> it's absolutely my preferred favorite way to do it. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, a couple of the big ones are that you have a lot more freedom to do a creative deal and make it work if you're working directly with the seller. So you now uh, that's actually leading in perfect segue into the question that I want to ask. I know that you can do creative financing with, with uh, single family homes, say like um, owner financing is one example is our multifamily apartments subject to the same ability to be creative. It's, it's actually more common with multifamily. Interesting. Interesting, right? A lot of people may not know that, but it is a, it's actually more common for the sellers to do that. It helps people get into the deal that may not be able to otherwise. Uh, and, it, you know, it's just something that, has, that they do. So that, that's an advantage of it. But the thing that you're able to do if you're working directly with a seller instead of going through a broker is work with them directly. Get to know them and try to discover their real motivation and why they're selling or would consider selling. And if you can figure out how to solve that problem, it, it might reveal some options to acquire the property that weren't available to you if you had been going through someone to negotiate the deal and structure the deal. 
like a broker, for example. So getting a getting direct to seller is hugely important. And B, the reason you'd want to do that is because you can still solve a problem. So you still can solve problems and add value as a multifamily investor is what you're saying. Absolutely. So if somebody wanted to break into the space, like the barrier to entry, unarguably for apartment complexes is significantly higher than say a house down the street. How would you recommend somebody start? I recommend they begin with education. So, um, you know, start to educate yourself by reading some good material, listening to some podcasts or some audio books, uh, you know, start to uh, maybe join some communities like, you know, like a, either a, a Facebook group that is run by a respected multifamily investor or, a, you know, maybe a site like Bigger Pockets or something like that where you can network with others and really begin that education process. That, that's the first step. Uh, another good one is to consider attending a, a conference or an event or, you know, some type of thing like the, I went to the, the Rod Cleef event. We, we talked about that on a previous episode. Um, you know, that's a great way to educate yourself and to begin learning. It's a great way to break into it. Okay. So education, absolutely the first and foremost thing you should do. Yeah. So you mean, you mean I shouldn't just give my money away to some syndication that's creating a, a pooling money? <laughs> right. I probably would not recommend that as my first step. So syndication is also something that I can almost guarantee if you're looking at apartment complexes is what you'll hear. And that's because we just talked about the barrier to entry is so high. And we did talk about it in episode 12, but can you give our listeners a reminder of what syndication is in a nutshell? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, syndication is, is basically putting together uh, more than one person to raise money for a deal. So if I got, uh, let's, say, let's say I got you and three other people to commit to investing $100,000 with me, uh, I'm syndicating a deal right there. Basically, uh, there, there's paperwork you have to have drawn up by an SEC attorney. Um, it, you have to start to really pay attention to make sure that you're following some legal guidelines uh, and you need an attorney who specializes in that type of law to help you with that. And, um, and things definitely become more complicated. But what you're able to do is, is really increase what you're able to buy in terms of the size of it. So, you know, if you guys all got together and we raised $300,000 to put down on a property, we can buy a much bigger property than if it's just me all by myself trying to buy something for say 50,000 as a down payment, right? Absolutely. And that's definitely something we teach at, at our cash flow event is that it's all about abundance. How can we pull our money together, resources together to take down a bigger opportunity and create that win-win situation? Right. There is something to be said, though, if you are raising money, the SEC is cracking down. That's what people smarter than Adam and I keep saying. So if you're trying to raise money through social media and you're doing it incorrectly, you should beware. Um, we're not opposed to raising money, but there are ways that you have to do it to follow those guidelines. So that's something that I think we should be clear about when it comes to we talked about raising money. Yeah, there are very specific steps you must go through. And when you start talking about syndication and raising money from multiple parties, um, you have to have a pre-existing relationship with the people who are investing with you. A lot of times there are criteria about uh, people's net worth or, or their income that need to be met. And um, it's very important that you follow all of those legal guidelines very closely. Absolutely. 100%. Is there anything else that you'd like to recommend people do if they're interested in multifamily investing as kind of a, a nugget for them to take away? I'd like for them to reach out to me. <laughs> I would <laughs> love to talk to them <laughs> because I love, you know, I'm like you, Kevin. I, I love to educate people. I, I am still learning and growing myself. You know, I, I do not consider myself an expert. I consider myself a lifelong learner. So um, I, I would like people who are interested and want to learn more, 
reach out to me uh, and I'll, I'll share with you what I can. I'll point you to resources that I think would work for you based on what you're trying to learn and where it sounds like your step in the journey is and, and just kind of help you get the materials and gain the knowledge that you'd like to. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for dropping those nuggets of knowledge onto us and, and our listeners. Uh, it's awesome that we have different investor identities so we can talk about different things and try different methods to be in better investors and see how they uh, run and play out in our different uh, asset classes. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. And to our listeners out there, uh, Kevin and I are always happy to hear from you. And we, we really strongly encourage you to reach out to us. You can get a hold of us at the Tech Guys Who Invest website, tgwipodcast.com. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you have feedback for us about the show or something you'd like to hear in the future, please reach out to us. And we're always interested in, in interviewing different types of people. So if you have any cool ideas, you're like, you know, I'd love to hear somebody who invests in, I don't know, some name and obscure asset class. We would love to bring them on the show and pick their brain as well. That way we can, we can get educated, Adam and I, but also all of you can get educated as well. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Bye.